This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. This episode contains explicit language. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This month, I've picked cases that were suggested by you, the listeners. This week, I'm covering a story about, well, I don't really know how to describe this individual. All I can say is that this case is one you will probably say really made your blood boil, which is saying a lot if you listen to as many true crime podcasts as I think you do. The antagonist in this story might just be one of the worst people I've ever researched. He's one of those individuals who should have had a good life in that he had all the advantages one could want early on, including a loving family, and a good education. But for whatever reason, he decided instead to spend his time creating chaos wherever he went, and basically, just be a complete asshole. Sorry, but that's the most accurate term I have for someone like Jameson Bachman. Listen to the details, and I'm pretty sure you'll agree. Before we begin, I want to thank Devin for suggesting this case. Thanks, Devin. This is the case of the worst roommate in the world, Jameson Bachman. When Jameson Bachman appeared before a judge in a Philadelphia courtroom in 2013, the judge expressed his feelings about the man who stood before him in no uncertain terms. I find you to be totally incredible, Judge Marvin Williams said. I don't believe a word you say, and frankly, you're frightening. Jameson Bachman had spent the last several months making the life of his roommate, Melissa Frost, miserable. Melissa had advertised a room available for rent in her home near Philadelphia. Bachman showed up on a November day the year prior, saying he was in immediate need of a place to stay. He claimed he had lost his home as a result of Hurricane Sandy and was just looking for a temporary place for a short time until he found a more permanent situation. Because he was a stranger and she felt put under pressure to make a decision quickly, Melissa was inclined to say no. But the dark-haired man who appeared to be in his 40s was polite, clean-cut, and pleasant. She found herself agreeing to allow him to rent the room for a period of two weeks. He promised he wouldn't stay any longer than 14 days. But Frost was a little taken aback the day he moved in, when Bachman brought what seemed to be all of his belongings, including two pets, a 13-year-old border collie mix named Zachary and a tabby cat named Abigail. She wondered how he still had so many possessions, since he claimed to have lost nearly everything in the hurricane. But she didn't pry. For the first day or so, everything was fine. They had a few conversations, and Melissa found Bachman to be smart and a good conversationalist. But by the weekend, he started expressing complaints about this or that, a dirty dish left in the sink or items that were in the common areas being slightly moved. She thought, okay, he's a little quirky. But again, she didn't comment. Then Bachman's behavior towards Melissa and her home became really problematic. He started dumping used cat litter down the toilet, clogging it up. He scuffed up the floors, moving things around, some things that didn't even belong to him. He piled items he owned in the kitchen, including a microwave oven for which there was no counter space. Melissa asked him to move it, but he just ignored her. Whenever she tried to talk to him, Bachman became loud and aggressive, invading her space with his body and sometimes poking his finger into her chest at the same time. Bachman claimed to have a law degree and said he earned a living, quote, doing litigation work and tutoring online. Whenever he was asked to respect the boundaries of her home, he would spout legal-sounding justifications for doing, well, whatever he felt like. Bachman accused Melissa of, quote, breaking the covenant of quiet enjoyment, end quote, a violation of his rights as a tenant. Bachman also threatened her regarding his property, saying, you'll be sorry if you touch my stuff. One day, she'd had it with his microwave cluttering up the kitchen, so she unplugged it and left it in his room. When Bachman returned and saw that it had been moved, he began screaming at her and saying she had no right to touch his things. He came at her aggressively, backing her up against the edge of the staircase. Shortly after this confrontation, Bachman's cat disappeared. He accused Melissa in a note written in all caps that said, You are the proximate cause of my cat's disappearance and presumed death. 
do not communicate with me again unless it is through your attorney, end quote. Melissa had had enough and just wanted him to leave. She even offered to return the money he had paid her for the first two weeks of rent back in November. Oh, and by the way, he'd never paid her another cent since. But Bachman refused to leave and just laughed at Melissa. It was as if he truly enjoyed creating chaos and watching her become upset. When she began crying out of frustration, he told her not to worry. You have your whole life in front of you, Bachman told her. You're pretty, you're talented, and you've got this house. Well, you don't have this house anymore. This house is my house, Bachman told her. Melissa couldn't figure out why he was being so hostile, unless he was just a mean guy for no good reason. There was only one thing she noted during his arguments with her. He clearly had a competitive thing with me, Melissa said. The fact that I'd gone to the University of Pennsylvania was a point that he consistently brought up when he was trying to tear me down. He would say, oh, your Ivy League degree won't help you with this, will it? Bachman's tactics were designed to force Melissa out of her own home so he could take it over himself. He even stopped leaving the house in case she tried to change the locks on him. She asked him to leave repeatedly, but when he wouldn't, she finally threatened to file an eviction notice. But Bachman knew that it would take time to go through the courts and would cause his landlord to incur the expense of a filing fee, court costs, time away from her job, etc. To him, it was a process he could manipulate and work to his own advantage. He would later say he was happy to have an eviction notice filed against him. Once she paid the filing fee, Bachman then piggybacked on the fee and added a counterclaim to the suit. This was a tactic he was familiar with and was just another way to drag out the fight. Meanwhile, he was still not paying any rent. You see, this was not the first time Bachman had used these types of bullying tactics with landlords and roommates. He had actually begun this scam while still in college. There were at least two others who'd been subjected to Jameson Bachman, the roommate from hell, since then. After Melissa Frost, there would be more. By 2017, Bachman must have believed he had this pattern of behavior perfected, talking himself into a new residence, quickly becoming a nuisance, and shirking on the rent to live for free. And it appeared, as a way to entertain himself by torturing those around him. But one person wasn't going to be intimidated by the serial squatter and decided to fight back. Bachman had finally met his match, and as he grew angry and more desperate to remain in control, he became dangerous. The holidays are almost upon us, and while it's supposed to be a season of fun and family, we'd be lying if we say it doesn't bring added stress as well. Whether that's due to just the extra tasks the season brings, stressful family dynamics, or dealing with schedules and travel, we can all use a little help coping with the things that life throws at us. Talkspace Online Therapy has licensed therapists available to help you manage stress, process significant life changes, and more. Take it from me, working with a licensed professional can help you feel less overwhelmed, more in control of your life, and help you take steps to enjoy this holiday season. I know it's helped me. It's fast and easy to get connected with a the therapist you'll love. Talkspace works around your schedule at your convenience with live video sessions and unlimited messages with your dedicated therapist. With my busy schedule, the convenience of Talkspace is priceless. Talkspace offers individual therapy, couples therapy, and even medication prescriptions should you need them. Thousands of licensed therapists are available to choose from today. So if you need a little support to help you through the end of the year or want to start building toward a better new year, Talkspace is here to help. Match with a licensed therapist when you go to Talkspace.com and get $100 off your first month with promo code ONCE. That's $100 off when you use code ONCE at Talkspace.com. If you're trying to come up with great gift ideas to check off your holiday list, I've got an amazing recommendation for you, Ana Luisa. Ana Luisa makes beautiful, sustainable jewelry that everyone on your list will be thrilled to receive. And right now, as a listener of this podcast, you can get 20% off when you go to analuisa.com slash once. It's their biggest sale of the year. I gifted an Ana Luisa pendant to my friend and she can't stop raving about it. Ana Luisa's earrings, pendants, bracelets, and rings are made crafted with care using the best noble metals. They're made in limited batches, ensuring the highest production standards while eliminating excessive waste, which is good for the planet. Their pieces come nicely packaged and ready for gift giving. Stackable rings are really in demand right now and perfect as gifts. Ana Luisa has some of the best I've seen. You can mix and match for different looks daily, and that's a gift that's sure to be a favorite. 
and Ana Luisa's jewelry prices start at just $39. Go to analuisa.com slash once to treat yourself and your loved ones with a unique gift and get 20% off your order. I absolutely recommend them. Such a great brand making beautiful sustainable jewelry. That's A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A dot com slash once. AnnaLuisa.com slash once to get 20% off with pieces starting at just $39. AnnaLuisa.com slash once. Melissa Frost had put up with Jameson Bachman's abuse for months. He'd destroyed her property, kicking in doors and clogging up toilets with cat litter. He'd also threatened her physically. When she tried to evict him through a court action, he turned the tables and countersued her for violating, quote, the warranty of habitability which, even though it is an actual legal term, nevertheless, sounds like bullshit. Now Bachman stood before a judge who wasn't buying it. Bachman, even if he did know the law, undercut his own case by coming off as arrogant, bullying, and condescending in court. His case was dismissed, and he was ordered to leave Melissa's home. But over his history as a renter, Bachman had made life hell for no less than six roommates, destroying their property, threatening them, and acting as if he was entitled to their home and their things, and even accusing them of crimes. And he did all of it while refusing to pay his rent. Melissa Frost came in the middle of this timeline. One of Bachman's first victims, not counting his college roommates, was 43-year-old Arlene Harabedian. Arlene, who owned a dog walking business, met Jameson Bachman in the summer of 2006, and the two began casually dating. She had rented an apartment located above a hobby shop in Richmond Hill, Queens, New York, and Bachman told her he needed a temporary place to live promising to stay for only two months. When Arlene first met Bachman, he told her he was a teacher at the Thornton Donovan School in New Rochelle. In reality, he'd already been let go after working at the private school for only one semester. Although he bragged that he'd been so highly regarded on campus that he was in the running to be the new headmaster, his sole review on RateMyTeacher.com was from a student who said Bachman, quote, scares me. While employed at the school, Bachman was given use of an apartment in a neighborhood near the campus. When his contract wasn't renewed, Bachman took that as an invitation to stop paying his rent. He then refused to move out of the apartment once his lease was up, squatting on the property for two months before the school administration obtained a court order and had him evicted. That's when he showed up on Arlene's doorstep. Of course, Bachman overstayed his two-month welcome, stretching the time out for months and then, if you can believe it, for years. Again, Bachman never paid more than the first month's rent and became a complete nightmare to live with. While Arlene had the option to move out of the apartment herself, since she was only renting, she knew Bachman would then become her landlord's problem. Being a good-hearted person, Arlene felt that was unfair. So, four long years passed, with Bachman squatting in her spare room. Arlene mainly tried to stay out of his way to keep the conflict down to a minimum. But one day in 2010, while she was going through her mail, she opened up the cable bill and suddenly became angry that Bachman had use not only of the apartment, but water, heat, electricity, and even cable television without contributing anything financially to the household. She snapped and confronted him, insisting he pay for half of the cable charges. Bachman, of course, refused and just smirked as if to say, and what are you going to do about it? I'm not a violent person, Arlene later said but she could not hold back her anger and frustration any longer and suddenly drew back her hand and slapped him. Bachman, immediately enraged, grabbed Arlene around the throat and began to choke her. She managed to break free and ran from the apartment screaming for help. Police arrived, but since they both accused one another of assault, officers merely wrote up the report and advised Arlene to file for a protective order with the court. Bachman immediately did the same, so even though they were still living in the same apartment, Legally, they were required to stay 100 yards from each other. Of course, this was untenable, so Arlene finally decided to file a notice of eviction against him. She and her landlord filed the notice with the county court in November of 2010. Upon receiving notice, Bachman then retaliated by claiming Arlene had threatened him with a knife. She was arrested but soon released. However, since she was now ordered not to go near the apartment where Bachman still resided, it was she who ended up moving out. Bachman stayed living there until the court ruled he must also vacate the apartment. In June of 2012, Bachman briefly became the bane of Sonia Acevedo's existence when he showed up at her Rockaway Beach condo in Queens. 
Sonia, a 49-year-old vet tech who was struggling to keep up with her mortgage, at first thought her new roommate was a godsend. He offered to pay the first two months' rent up front, writing her a check for $1,400. Things started out well, and Sonia and Bachman actually became friends. They ate breakfast together each morning, spent time in conversation getting to know one another, and ran errands together. He was even a comfort to her when one of her cats died. As a cat lover himself, he sympathized with her and offered his support. But before too long, Bachman was up to his old tricks. One day, Sonia noticed the chandelier in the dining room was gone. Then her bookshelves began filling with books she'd never seen before, and her plants and furniture were moved around. When she'd move them back, the next day, she'd find them moved again. Why did Bachman do these things? Was it for a sense of control? Was he playing a sick game? He knew it upset his roommate, but he continued these annoying habits. Then his behavior escalated. Sonia began to realize that Bachman was entering her bedroom while she was out. In order to prove he was trespassing into her private space, she placed a wine bottle behind her door. If anyone opened it even slightly, it would fall over, and she would know for certain. She then planned to confront him about the breach. But her plan didn't provide the desired result. When she returned home, she saw that the wine bottle had just been moved a few inches away from where she left it, so as not to be knocked over by the door. Maybe Sonia didn't fight back enough or get upset enough about his behavior, and Bachman eventually grew tired of playing these games because just months later, he moved in with Melissa Frost and began annoying her instead. After Melissa Frost finally got rid of her roommate from hell, Jameson Bachman began looking for a new living situation. His next three rentals were shared with male roommates, but they didn't last long. Each time, Bachman started with his usual pattern of behavior, moving things around, complaining about tiny inconveniences like a dish left in the sink, and then refusing to pay his rent. Usually by the second month, he'd cite some quote-unquote legal loophole in order to get out of his financial obligations. He often cited his law degree as a way to intimidate these roommates from calling him out on his bull, and sometimes it worked. He also threatened lawsuits against them, and as most people who share rent with another person aren't usually up on the laws regarding such arrangements, this worked in Bachman's favor, at least for a while. But in the spring of 2017, Bachman answered one more ad regarding a room for rent, this time in the Chestnut Hill area of Philadelphia. But by now, he may have realized that his name might be recognized as someone who was more than a little problematic, so he gave an alias. He told Alex Miller, who was renting a room in her apartment after her roommate unexpectedly moved out, that his name was Jed Creek. Alex had listed the available rental on Craigslist for two weeks before receiving an inquiry from Jed Creek. Wary about meeting a stranger for the first time in her home, Alex asked him to meet her at a local Starbucks to size him up first. She was just 31 and figured Jed to be at least in his 50s. In fact, he was 60 years old, but looked almost a decade younger. Perhaps this was due to his full head of jet black hair, which he most likely dyed to look younger. He told her he'd grown up in the area and was an attorney. He listed his travels around the world to New York, the Netherlands, and the Middle East. He was very polite, well-spoken, and in Alex's words, seemed to her a courtly gentleman. He'd been looking for a place for a while, he said, but he hadn't had much luck. He was back in the area caring for his brother and his mother. He said his mother was elderly and frail and that his brother, a bit older than himself, was dealing with health issues related to hepatitis C. After time conversing with her potential renter, Alex felt comfortable enough to invite him to see the apartment. He toured the place and said he liked it very much, and he was ready to put down a deposit if she agreed. They had spent more than an hour talking together at the apartment and had discovered some shared interests, Buddhism, meditation, and their love of animals. Alex also had a cat. She decided she liked Jed and agreed to let him take the room. He wrote her a check for $800. There was just one slight hesitation on Alex's part when he handed her the check. There was no printed name or address on it, so he wrote out her address in the corner, as if he'd already been a resident there for some time. She was relieved then when a couple of days later, she deposited the check and it cleared with no problem. After giving her the deposit, he said he'd be back later that evening to move in his belongings. He returned with six large plastic bins and a cat carrier. 
He had no suitcases, moving boxes, or furniture. In lieu of a bed, he brought along a stack of comforters and laid those on the floor of his room to sleep on. Now, I'd think it was a bit weird that a successful attorney and world traveler would have neither luggage nor a bed, but maybe I'm just more suspicious. Anyway, as was his pattern at first, Jed Creek was a great roommate. He was polite and charming, and they soon became friends, drinking wine together in the evenings while watching the Rachel Maddow show, which they were both fans of. The older man even showed a protective side to his younger roommate. When an old boyfriend showed up one evening unwelcome and refused to leave, he stepped in and told the man to go or he'd remove him himself. Alex's unwelcome guest left, and she was grateful that her new roommate had helped avert the awkward situation. The first sign of a red flag didn't pop up until 10 days into his stay. Alex asked him to cover a portion of the utility bill, but he refused. He said he didn't owe her anything, since the majority of the charges were accrued before he'd moved in. The amount she was asking for was barely $70, but he flatly refused. But Alex Miller was also headstrong and thought her roommate should help pay for at least a portion of the bill. She texted him a couple of times, continuing to ask for payment, and was surprised when he responded by saying that they could, quote, handle it in court if she refused to drop the matter. She gave in. But immediately after this, Jed began to exhibit bizarre and annoying behavior, as he'd done with previous roommates. One evening, she came home and turned on the lights, except they didn't work. When she checked the bulbs, she discovered that they were all missing. Her roommate had taken all of them out of the lamp sockets and used them to light his own room. She then noticed that her six dining room chairs were missing. When she looked inside her roommate's room, she found the chairs stacked together to form a makeshift desk. Alex left for work each day and thought her roommate did as well, but she learned from her neighbors that he appeared to be hanging around the neighborhood most of the day. Well, she then wondered, did he actually have a job? Then right before the rent was due, she received a text from him saying that he'd found a cigarette butt floating in the toilet. For this reason, he was refusing to pay the rent. Alex worked as a paralegal, and Jed now told her, as a paralegal, you should know the warranty of habitability, a warranty of habitability is an implied agreement that a landlord is legally entitled to provide a safe and livable residence, and this includes basic and important things like regular access to hot water, a working heater, sturdy walls and a roof to keep the elements out, and the absence of danger from toxins like lead and mold. It does not require them to keep the residence spotless or cater to the whims of the renter. But Jed cited a lone cigarette butt as a justifiable reason for him to withhold the rent. Alex was getting more pissed off by the day with Jed Creek. It had been barely two weeks, but he was definitely getting on her nerves. Alex told her mother, Susan, about her roommate's behavior. Susan asked for his phone number, and when she got to a computer, Googled it. She immediately called her daughter. Alex, we have a problem, she told her. Jed Creek is not who he says he is. Jameson Bachman used an alias when he moved into Alex Miller's apartment, but his true identity was soon discovered. He was someone who'd been a problem to several landlords and roommates over the years, and Alex and her mother Susan dug into his history to find out who they were really dealing with. Jameson Bachman was born in Elkins Park, a suburb located in northern Philadelphia. His father James owned a construction business, and his mother Joan stayed home full-time to care for her two sons. Jameson, and his older brother by four years, Harry. As the baby of the family, Jameson was, by all accounts, the favored child, or at least was treated that way. Whether he was doted on because he was truly a delightful baby and child, or, as I perhaps cynically believe, was extremely needy from his earliest days and unpleasant when he didn't receive constant attention and praise, well, we can only speculate. In either case, according to reports, Jim and Joan treated their youngest child as the golden child. He was very bright and precocious, but in the words of a childhood friend, Jameson Bachman was, quote, the cockiest kid you'll ever meet. He got good marks in school, played tennis, and loved to read, especially books about the history of Western civilization. He was also extremely competitive and could be a bully when playing even a simple board game with his brother or friends. Bachman had to win at all costs, and people often gave him his way, just to end the game and get on with their lives. 
His parents were often heard praising him, calling him champ, and assuring him that he was the best at everything he attempted. By contrast, Harry, his brother, was somewhat relegated to the background, the second best, the second favorite, if you will. But Harry was steady, worked hard, and was well-liked by his peers. He would go on to have a bright future, something his brother would grow to resent later in his life. The Bachmans had high expectations for their gifted son, Jameson. Jameson had long been enamored of his maternal grandfather, Abraham J. Brem Levy, a prominent defense attorney in Philadelphia. Levy founded a criminal defense firm with Samuel Dash, who was the youngest district attorney ever to serve the city of Philadelphia. Dash would later serve as chief counsel to the Senate Watergate Commission in 1973. Bachman often boasted about his grandfather, saying his grandfather had taken him to court, where he had observed Levy defend those accused of crimes from theft to murder. However, as much as Bachman bragged about his grandfather, I found very little information about him or his trials. In fact, Samuel Dash does have a number of articles and biographies written about his accomplishments, but none of them that I found made any mention of his association with Abraham Levy. Bachman aspired to follow in his grandfather's footsteps as a lawyer. To this end, he enrolled in Tulane University in 1975, but within a year, he had dropped out and returned home to Philadelphia. Perhaps this was because he had his first taste of the reality that he was not the brightest, best, most talented young man in the world, as he'd been told by his parents, but was just one of the many young people who, with hard work and effort, could succeed even if they weren't considered exceptional. This is something many young people have to face when they leave their high schools and hometowns to enroll in college where they may matriculate alongside the best and brightest from all over the country. Sometimes this is a rude awakening for those, like Jameson Bachman, who have an overinflated sense of themselves. Or perhaps it was due to another factor entirely. In January of 1977, when he'd only been on campus for a few months, Jameson Bachman witnessed a brutal murder. Bachman was visiting a fraternity house just off the Tulane University campus in January of 1977. He was not a member of the fraternity, but was simply hanging out with a friend from Elkins Park, Ken Gutzeit. Ken was a year older than Bachman and, according to reports, had been in an ongoing feud with a student librarian named Randall Vidrine. The fight had begun the previous fall and had carried into the new year, becoming even more heated as the weeks passed. Now, this is an odd detail, but supposedly it's 100% true. Vidrine had called campus police officers on Gutzeit for, of all things, eating a cheese sandwich among the library's book stacks. A police officer was later quoted as saying that as far as he knew, they never fought about anything else. In front of the frat house on that January day, Vidreen appeared, pulled out a knife, and slashed Ken Gutzeit across the throat. Bachman, who was a witness along with a dozen others, would say he saw his friend beheaded on the steps of the Sigma Chi house. Gutzeit bled to death, but another strange detail a grand jury declined to indict the 25-year-old librarian for the murder. Soon after witnessing this horrific act of violence, Bachman dropped out of Tulane and returned to Philadelphia. He began acting paranoid and ranting to anyone who'd listen about anti-Semitism and the increased threats to the state of Israel. He was later evaluated by a therapist who characterized Bachman's personality as one motivated almost exclusively by an external locus of control. An external locus of control, a psychological term, is an aspect of an individual's personality in which they perceive events in their lives, such as failure or success in school, relationships, and other life events, to be caused by factors outside of themselves and not within their own control. In other words, they do not perceive their own behaviors and actions as the cause of their life experiences, good or bad, but from outside of themselves, other people, situations, or even simply fate. They therefore don't believe that changing their behavior will result in a better outcome and may instead blame others for their problems. While this assessment caused the therapist to wonder whether Bachman may have a personality disorder, in the end, he was only diagnosed with mild depression. Bachman didn't return to school and at the end of the summer dropped out of sight. Friends would not see him again for a couple of decades when he eventually returned to the Philadelphia area. He ran into a childhood friend, Bob Friedman, who Bachman told that he lived in Israel for a time and served in the Israeli Defense Force. He also claimed to have met a Dutch woman and moved to the Netherlands, but he'd since broken up with her and was now back in his hometown. 
Friedman was surprised to discover that his friend, who'd once seemed to have such a promising future, was now working entry-level part-time jobs. Friedman had succeeded where his friend had not, becoming a journalist covering the White House for PBS. He then retired from that career and opened a barbecue restaurant franchise called Red Hot and Blue with prominent political strategist Lee Atwater. Wanting to help out his old friend, Friedman hired Bachman as a shift manager at the restaurant. He also allowed him to stay temporarily in his home. But Bachman, always one to overshoot the mark, creeped out Friedman's wife while living in their home and showed up to work acting like a big shot and trying to boss everyone around. He told employees that he had been hired as a consultant to turn the restaurant around. The franchise was actually doing just fine, thank you very much, but Bachman's highly competitive nature wouldn't allow him to take a back seat to his old friend. In short order, Friedman fired Bachman and sent him packing. Another person Bachman hated taking a back seat to was his brother Harry. Harry Bachman had done well for himself, earning an architecture degree from Cornell University, marrying a psychologist, and raising two daughters in his hometown of Elkin Park. Bob Friedman would say that Jameson's parents were ashamed that their younger child, their golden boy, had just drifted, and now at the age of almost 40, still had not found his footing. So when their son Jameson came to them hat in hand at the age of 40, telling them he wanted them to pay for law school, they refused. Bachman became resentful of his parents, especially his father, whom he accused of favoring his brother Harry, whose college education he had paid for. Never mind that they had paid his tuition to Tulane as well before he dropped out. In Bachman's mind, his parents abandoned him and hadn't seen to his needs. He would also accuse his mother of trying to control him and turning on him at, quote, the age of eight when I started to express my own opinions, end quote. He cut off both of his parents, not even bothering to visit his father when he became ill with cancer or attend his funeral. He did, however, return to attend the reading of his father's will, expecting to receive a portion of the estate. When instead he learned that it had been left solely to his mother, he was furious. Bachman eventually returned to school, taking law classes at Georgetown University and then transferring to the University of Miami. It was there that he completed his law degree in 2002 at the age of 45. But after taking the bar exam just once the following year and failing, Bachman never tried again. So contrary to what he told people, he never held a law license or practiced law in any capacity. This was surprising given the fact that his law professors singled Bachman out as particularly bright and talented. One professor at Georgetown even said, in 20 years of university teaching, I have encountered very few people of his caliber. By the time Bachman met Alex Miller, he had crapped out of any number of jobs due to his bullying ways, aggressive personality, and arrogant attitude with others. It appeared that the best job he had ever obtained was as a private school teacher, which, as I mentioned earlier, didn't last long before he was sacked. By 2017, he was apparently only earning an income as a part-time online tutor, if at all. Once Alex Miller found out about Bachman's history as a serial scammer who'd bullied and intimidated his former roommates and received free rent in return, she was determined not to be his next victim. Alex, headstrong herself, would become a worthy adversary for Bachman and would finally put an end to his schemes, but not in a way anyone would have imagined. Jameson Bachman had spent his adult years bullying, intimidating, and taking advantage of people. His motivation seemed simply to be, pardon my French, to fuck with people. There was no real tangible reason for his behavior, except for living rent-free for a period of time. But who would truly want such a thing if it meant your home life was tense, stressful, uncomfortable, and the people you lived with hated your guts? Except Bachman didn't really seem that tense or uncomfortable. In fact, he seemed to derive sadistic pleasure from making other people miserable. Maybe this was the only way he felt he could measure up to others or feel in control. A person who lives their life in this way can only have extreme insecurities about their self-worth, no matter how much they try to cover it up through arrogance and braggadocio. But Bachman, who is calling himself Jed Creek, a hyper-masculine name for someone who probably feels like a very small man, don't you think? Had been unmasked by Alex Miller as a serial squatter and mega scammer, and she was not going to put up with his nonsense. Alex's mother Susan learned that her daughter's roommate's real name was Jameson Bachman and also discovered his history as the roommate from hell. The first thing she did was drive over to Alex's apartment to confront him. 
She let herself in the front door without warning. Bachman came rushing out of his room, yelling, What are you doing in my home? Susan answered, This is my daughter's home, Jameson. Susan said that the color drained from his face when she addressed him by his real name. He had no idea that Alex had found out about this deception. Susan told him that she wanted him out of the apartment, but he just answered, I'll see you in court. Alex, who worked as a paralegal, borrowed letterhead from her boss and typed out a notice she left for Bachman. It read, quote, Local police authorities have been alerted as to your previously recorded disputes as a tenant in sufferance, end quote. He ignored the letter. She placed a new advertisement in order to secure a new tenant for the room she planned to kick Bachman out of. But when a prospective renter came to view it, he refused to unlock the bedroom door. But Alex was not giving up. She thought, he likes to play games? Okay, let's play. On May 1st, she threw a party attended by her mother, friends, and neighbors. The invitation read, a send-off for serial squatter Jameson Bachman. That night, everyone arrived for an evening of themed activities. She created cocktails using Jameson Irish whiskey, get it, by the way, my fave. And she turned up the music at full volume, making sure it was rap music, which she knew that Bachman couldn't stand. She'd even found an article detailing his feud and lawsuit against Melissa Frost. To show him that she knew all about his past record of abuses towards roommates, she photocopied Melissa's picture and taped copies up in the bathroom where she was sure he'd see them. But like he'd done with Melissa, Bachman had taken to holding up in his room as much as possible so that Alex couldn't change the locks and bar him from entering the apartment. During the party, the guests could hear him in his room shouting out in anger. That's scary. Finally, I guess when he couldn't stand it anymore, Bachman exited his room, dumped his cat's litter down the toilet, and stormed out of the apartment with just his dog and his backpack. Once he was gone, Alex and a couple of her friends went to Bachman's bedroom and removed the doorknob from the door. Her friends warned Alex not to remain in the apartment that night, but she refused to be driven from her own home. She couldn't be sure what he'd do if she left. Destroy the place? Change the locks himself? No, she wasn't taking any chances, so she stayed. He didn't return that night. But the following morning, May 2nd, while Alex brushed her teeth, Bachman returned, storming through the front door. He made a beeline for Alex, trapping her in the bathroom against the sink. He grabbed her by the throat and she screamed. He let her go and stomped towards his bedroom. But Alex was really angry now. She followed him into his bedroom where he sat on his pile of quilts slash bed, dicing up food for his cat with a knife. Bachman, his roommate said, took excellent care of his pets and fed them premium food, including meat and fish he diced up himself for their meals. Alex shouted at him, Who the fuck do you think you are? Bachman got up from the floor and came towards her, knife still in his hand. He leaned against the door to keep her out. Since there was no longer a knob, he couldn't lock her out. But as he did so, her leg became trapped between the door and the frame. Bachman said through clenched teeth, You've made a grave mistake. He stabbed his knife toward her trapped leg, cutting her thigh. Alex pulled her leg out and ran into her room, where she called the police. When the cops arrived, Bachman made a show of acting completely rational and in control. He was polite when answering the officers and even apologized, saying Alex's injury was an unfortunate accident. Seeing the extent of the injury Bachman had caused, the officers put him under arrest and charged him with aggravated assault. He was then placed in jail, and Alex immediately filed for an order of protection, which was granted. Alex and Susan went into Bachman's room and found reams of court documents from previous filings by and against his former roommates. But the most disturbing thing they found was a box for a pistol along with some bullets. The gun, however, was missing. They looked everywhere for it, wanting to ensure that he didn't have access to a weapon if he was bailed out of jail, but they couldn't find it. They even used a metal detector to search for it, but had no luck. Bachman had been in jail since May 2nd and had reached out to his brother Harry for help. Harry and his wife Caroline had once allowed Jameson to live in their home briefly, but he had soon disrupted their lives as well and was asked to leave. Now, however, Harry felt bad that his brother was sitting in jail. So on June 17th, he posted bail and Bachman was released while awaiting his trial on the assault charge. A few weeks later, Alex and Susan Miller arranged to meet Bachman at the police station to return his belongings. As they arrived, Bachman, annoying as ever, filmed their arrival and narrated the sequence of events on his phone. 
They handed him his bins and his cat, Abigail, who was in her carrier, but did not bring his dog, Zachary. The dog had been fostered out to a woman who was in the process of adopting him. A judge had ruled that Alex was the de facto owner of the abandoned dog, and the Millers sought out a good home for the elderly canine. Bachman, just learning about the fate of his dog, and why hadn't he asked earlier or had his brother find a temporary home for the poor dog, one must wonder. He became enraged. Outside of the police station, Bachman drove by the Millers, rolled down his window, and said to Alex, You're dead, bitch. Alex returned to the station and reported the threat, which was a violation of the protection order. A few weeks later, Bachman was rearrested and returned to jail. He started calling Harry again, saying he wanted to be bailed out immediately. Harry tried to stall him, but Bachman insisted, saying he wanted to retrieve his cat, who had been left behind at an Airbnb when he was arrested for the second time. Unknown to him, the cat had been taken to an animal shelter as an abandoned pet and had been adopted by a new owner. So both animals were safe and given new homes with non-crazy people, so that's a relief. Bachman continued to harass Harry about bailing him out and finally wore him down. Harry Bachman bailed out his brother for the second time on October 28, 2017. But no good deed goes unpunished, so Bachman now also requested to stay with Harry and his family. To this, Harry said no. He knew Caroline was uncomfortable around his brother, and now that Jameson was a felon, he didn't feel safe having him in their home. At the time of Bachman's release from jail, Caroline was out of town visiting their new grandchild. Harry was to take time off work the following week to meet her there. Caroline was nervous about Harry being alone at the house now that Jameson was out on bail, and she asked her husband to stay elsewhere, but Harry said he'd be fine. On November 3rd, Harry returned home to grab his things and head out of town to meet up with his wife. As he pulled into the driveway of his home, Harry sent a text to his wife. Guess who just showed up as I drove in, it read. That was the last she heard from him. Harry didn't arrive that night in upstate New York as planned. Caroline phoned the police and requested they check on her husband at their house. When officers arrived, they found a trail of blood that led from the sidewalk to the front door. Once inside, they saw a bloody drag mark leading to the basement. Behind the basement door, they found the body of 64-year-old Harry Bachman lying on the stairs. It appeared that he had fought desperately for his life. Blood was splattered in the dining room and a hole had been punched through the wall. The medical examiner would determine that Harry had died as a result of blunt force trauma to the head and body. Police units were given a description of Jameson Bachman and his car, and a few hours later, they found his vehicle parked at the Fairfield Inn and Suites in Willow Grove. He had checked into the hotel using the name and identification of the brother he had beaten to death. A SWAT team was called, and they broke into the motel room that evening. While the original report stated that Jameson Bachman was taken into custody, quote, without incident, his mugshot tells a different story. The photo shows him with a swollen face, his eyes dead behind a vacant stare, and a streak of blood running down his cheek. A later affidavit would report that, as police entered the room, Bachman came at them swinging a small camping axe. He was charged with murder, theft, receiving stolen property, and identity theft, and booked into jail. His preliminary hearing was scheduled for December 11th. But on the day of the hearing, those who came to watch the proceedings were told that it had been canceled. A few days earlier, Jameson Bachman was found hanging in his cell. It appeared that no one would get their day in court, and Jameson Bachman made sure to have the last word. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. So what do you think was Bachman's motivation for killing his brother? Had he completely lost his mind? Was it jealousy? Did he snap when his brother refused his demands? I, for one, have determined that Jameson Bachman should be given the title Worst Person in the World. Really, I very much hate that guy. Anyway, I want to say thank you once again to Devin for suggesting this case. Even though I gnashed my teeth through the research and writing process on this one, it was still a fascinating story. Thanks, Devin. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Help with research and final audio mixing by Lorena Garcia, and copy editing was done by Crystal Dernan. Until next time, be good to one another.